Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back uh, for those of you that were here this morning. We're just waiting for everybody to be let in to the uh, webinar. So we'll give it a minute or two uh, for the, everyone to assemble. Okay. All right. I think I'm going to make a start. Right. Good afternoon. I'm um, Jane Pavitt uh, from Kingston University. I'm chairing this afternoon's session um, of the Kitchen Power National Parallel uh, Parallels uh, Symposium. And um, well, first of all, I'd like to welcome those people who are joining for the first time. Um, this is the second session, as I said. But those of you uh, who have arrived for the first time, uh, you'll know that the um, symposium is arranged uh, and convened by Saoirse O'Brien in support of her co-curated exhibition Kitchen Power at the National Museum of Ireland Country Life and has brought together a, a range of international speakers um, in support of this theme. It's a very exciting event. Um, I'm sure we're all missing the fact that we could have been in, uh, in Ireland for this. Um, but probably appropriately, many of you like me are sitting in your kitchens right now listening to this. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to thank Sosha for bringing us all together and uh, uh, arranging this uh, amazing lineup of speakers. Okay, so this afternoon's session is devoted to um, a national parallel be uh, between uh, Belgium and um, Scandinavia. Uh, we have two speakers. I'm going to introduce them uh, um, uh, before each of their papers, but then we're going to take questions and discussion after both papers. Um, so please hold your questions back for either speaker until the end, and hopefully we'll also get some questions that will um, uh, generate some discussion between them and we will pick up on some of the excellent um, uh, questions and indeed fantastic papers in this morning's session as well. Okay right so without further ado um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker this afternoon many of you will know Dr Freddie Flore from the uh, from KU Leuven the Faculty of Architecture. She's associate professor there uh, her PhD on discourses on better living in Belgium in the immediate post-war period was published in 2010 uh, by Leuven University Press. Currently her, her most recent research focuses on the representational role of architecture, interiors and furniture design in the second half of the 20th century. She's a member of the research group Architecture, Interiority and Inhabitation at Leuven. She's commissioning editor of the uh, Journal of Architecture as well and she's published and edited many national and international contributions to design history including the politics of furniture, um, identity diplomacy and persuasion in post-war interiors uh, and she's currently co-supervising the project Designing Embassies for Middle Powers, the Architecture of Belgian and Dutch Diplomacy in a globalizing world. Um, so welcome Freddie. Freddie's paper is entitled Promoting Modern Domesticity in the Belgian Countryside, Housing Advice to the Belgische uh, Born and Bond 1945 to 57. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Freddie now. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your kind introduction, uh, Jane. I will try and share my screen. Um, so here it is, I think. Share. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Right, um, so my talk today um, is actually based on uh, my PhD study, which I finalized um, many years ago now in 2006, and which focused on the way models of modern living were mediated in Belgium between the end of the world, Second World War and 1958, which was the year of the Brussels World's Fair. More specifically, the PhD discussed and compared the home advice programs of a series of national organizations, among which uh, the Belgische Burenenbond. 
which uh, I would translate as Belgian Union of Farmers' Wives, uh, the subject of today's presentation. Many of the post-war home advice programs uh, of that era had their roots in the interwar period and separately tried to adapt to a, at the time, drastically modernizing society. Um, see. I'm trying to go to the next slide. Yes. The Belgian Union of Farmers Wives was a Christian organization for rural women, which in the post-war years set up an intense advisory program on modern living in a rural environment. As I will show, it promoted a way of living which was meant to combine modern comfort with the preservation of the concept of a traditional rural living environment. And this also reflects on how they approached the subject of the kitchen. The union had already, already started its campaign for modern living before the war, but today's talk focuses on the post-war period, on the drastic developments in the social and material context of that time, and on the dramatic impact of these developments on the discourses on modern living um, at the same time. More specifically, the Belgian Union of Farmers' Wives had to deal with the fact that the once much clearer distinction between rural and urban living in areas in Belgium quickly faded after World War II. First of all, the amount of professional farmers was drastically decreasing as many rural inhabitants left the countrysides to find work in the city. Furthermore, the development of public transport and the new post-war housing policy, which mainly stimulated private ownership and the erection of single family houses, made it possible to build a house on the countryside or in the city suburbs while working somewhere else. As a result, rural inhabitants were not necessarily farmers anymore and the new housing policy, which lacked an overall structuring urban program, gave way to today's well-known excessive sprawl in Belgium, a scattered scene of ribbon development and detached houses. And this image is of course a contemporary image of what happened in, in uh, that time. The advisory program on modern living of the Belgian Union of Farmers' Wives essentially embraced the sociological segregation of the rural population. At the same time, it tried hard to preserve the severely threatened concept of the, rural, of the traditional rural living environment in Belgium. And this was of course an impossible mission. Instead of preserving the traditional rural housing culture, the Belgian Union of Farmers' Wives ended up constructing a new, largely artificial, modern image of traditional rural living, fit for all rural inhabitants, farmers or not. In this lecture, I will argue that although this image was, was meant to be different, it also had a lot in common with other contemporary Christian-inspired model homes, especially those of the Katholieke Arbeidersfrauengilden, or the Catholic Workers' Women's Guilds. And on slide, I'm comparing periodicals of these two women organizations. But I'll get back to that. So first, some background information. I, I will keep it really short, as time is limited. The Belgian Union of Farmers' Wives was established in 1911 as part of the Belgische Boerenbond, or the Belgian Farmers' Union. Both organizations had the same mission. They wanted to stimulate the improvement of agri agriculture, to add to the welfare of the peasantry, and to strengthen the faith of the Catholic Church and Christian morality. The program of the Belgian Union of Farmers' Wives concentrated on the education of women and on their responsibilities as farmers' wives, housewives, and mothers. They organized lessons for, on, for example, cattle breeding, dairy production, cooking and sewing, the nursing of children, hygiene, and the care of the sick. The farmer's house, or the rural home, played a central role in this advisory program. After World War II, the Belgian Farmers' Union was a very influential national institution. By then, the organization of the Belgian Union of Farmers' Wives consisted about, of about 1,000 local farmers' wives' guilds, 
which were supervised by two female inspectors per province. Although after World War II, the farmers' population was severely decreasing, the amount of members of the Belgian Union of Farmers' Wives gradually grew from about 90,000 in 1944 to about 130,000 in 1959. This might seem strange, but there were several explanations for this phenomenon. First of all, since the interwar period, the Belgian Farmers' Union in general was able to develop a strong position by gradually addressing a rural public broader than farmers only, by offering an increasing diversity, an increasing diversity of activities and specialized services. Also, the growing market of new household appliances and the development of new farming techniques, for example, in the field of dairy production, ensured the continuous need for educational activities for rural women. So now we come to the post-war home advice of the Belgian Union of Farmers' Wives. One of the fundamental concerns of the union was the so-called embellishment of rural living. The idea was to revalorize the rural way of living, which according to Christian ideology was threatened by, by modern society. Since the 19th century, Christian belief saw the farmer as the guardian of a set of existential values of food, procreation, good morals, spiritual health, social order, religion, etc. The Union of Farmers' Wives mainly focused on the responsibilities of women in relation to the beauty of the rural living environment. Basically, rural women were expected to take care of the health and the happiness of their family members. They had to be a good wife and advisor of their husband, an honorable member of the Union of Farmers' Wives, and an exemplary representative of the rural community. This implied that, among other things, women were responsible for the establishment for a, of a good rural family home. And by means of several educational activities, the Union of Farmers' Wives explained how this good rural home could or should be constructed. There were household courses and series of articles in the new union, union's periodical. Moreover, in 1945, the Union of Farmers' Wives established a special Commissie voor schone Hofsteden, or Commission for Beautiful Farmsteads, which was meant to study the problem of the farmstead, to gain interest for it, and to provide information on how to deal with it. And on slide, you see the logo of that commission. One of the most influential realizations of the commission was the illustrated book, The Boerenwoning, or translated The Farmer's House, published in 1945. This book was a precursor of the Landelijke Woning, or the Rural Home, or the Rural House, published by the Union of Farmers' Wives in 1953, and with several extended editions in 54, 55, 57, etc. Several editions of the Landelijke Woning mainly consisted of a presentation of Het Huis Onze Dromen, translated The House of Our Dreams, a model home which expressed the housing ideals of the Union of Farmers' Wives. The House of Our Dreams was extensively discussed in the Union's periodical, and the Union also organized several exhibitions with a full-scale model of the house, which you see here on slide. For years, the House of Our Dreams and the editions of the Rural House formed the spine of the home advice of the Union of Farmers' Wives. A study of the content of these advisory initiatives shows the struggle of the organization to design a house, including a kitchen, which was at the same time modern and rural, functional and traditional. The large amount of energy put into designing the House of Our Dreams and into communicating its basic principles to the union members illustrates the importance of the home advice program in the construction of a common identity for an increasing heterogeneous group of rural inhabitants. Here also lies the origin of a growing conflict with this other important organization for Christian women, the earlier mentioned Catholic Workers' Women. This organization developed an elaborate home educational program for Christian workers' women. 
and explicitly focused on the working class, but this also included the working class women living in a rural environment. At this, as this last group was also part of the target group of the Union of Farmers' Wives, the two women organizations developed a tense relationship which stimulated the urge to develop a distinct, distinctive identity. However, as they both wanted to promote modern, comfortable, Christian homes, the similarities between the home advice programs were almost inevitable. So let us first look at the architectural model promoted by the Union of Farmers' Wives. Compared to the Christian workers' women, the Union of Farmers' Wives devoted a lot of attention to the architectural and building aspects of the modern home. This was, of course, the result of the generally larger financial means of its members. The books on the farmer's house and the rural house described in detail the architectural features of a good rural home. As the titles of the book suggest, after World War II, the scope of the union gradu gradually widened from houses which were part of a farm to rural houses in general. However, the architectural descriptions remained more or less equally detailed. The farmer's house gave, the con gave concrete suggestions on the orientation, the location, the design and the materials of the building. For example, it recommended a longhouse situated within some distance from the street and with a large pitched roof with a slope of 45 to 60 degrees. It was suggested that the house should contain an entrance hall, an all-in-one kitchen living room, a parlor, a small room to do the dishes, a baking place, a bathing and wash house, bedrooms, a cellar and an attic. As building materials, as building materials the Commission for Beautiful Farmsteads suggested reed, Flemish roof tiles, natural slates, handmade bricks, brightly colored shutters, etc. Although the renowned modernist architect Hugh Poste published a vivid critique of this kind of romantic aesthetic advice, the Union of Farmers' Wives more or less continued on the same track. The most significant evolution was the fact that the 50s editions of the rural house further zoomed in on the house and showed less interest in its immediate surroundings, like whether or not it was part of a farm. Now a complete model house, the house of our dreams, was presented. A freestanding, one-story, single-family house with an entrance hall, a parlor, a bathing and wash house, bedrooms, one on the ground floor, several on, under, under the, the, the roof, a cellar, an attic and a toilet. Instead of an all-in-one kitchen living room, in combination with a small kitchen to do the dishes, there was only one living room with a cupboard separating the kitchen from the dining and living area. This layout implied the use of a gas or electric cooker and a separate heating system for the living area instead of the traditional tubular stove, which used to be used simultaneously for cooking and heating. The architectural advice of the rural house was at least as elaborate as, the farmers, as that in the farmer's house. It was especially the case with the detailed description of the front facade of the house of our dreams, a perfectly symmetrical design which symbolized the, mor the moral integrity and happiness of the, of the perfect Christian family. The emphasis laid on the design of the facade and the way it dominated the external appearance of the full and the way it dominated the external appearance of the full-scale exhibition model of the House of Our Dreams clearly shows what was happening. Whereas in 1945 the farmer's house stated that a rural house should have four equally important facades and that it should be part of the rural landscape. The 50s editions of the rural house reduced the external appearance of the ideal rural home to an almost cartoon-like front facade, as if it was a mask shouting out the rural identity of the house, which was inevitably losing its rural identity. 
So what about the interior of the house? The post-war advice of the Union of Farmers' Wives on the interior of the home was usually structured, structured as a successive discussion of rooms. It consisted of a series of practical suggestions regarding the use of materials and the arrangement of furniture in order to create a comfortable, labor-saving, hygienic and rural modern interior. In the 50s, the appearance of the model rooms of the Union of Farmers' Wives strongly resembled those of the Catholic workers' women. For example, from around 1953, they made use of the same furniture, furniture from the Ghent furniture firm van der Berghepovers. And you see a comparison here on slide from an exhibition room uh, of the Union of Farmers' Wives, wives compared to uh, also an exhibition organized by the Christian workers' women on the right. Nevertheless, in the early post-war years, the Union of Farmers' Wives had made significant efforts to reinforce the rural character of its model interiors. For example, in 1945, the Union had organized a competition for the design of rural furniture, and you see one of the winning designs on slide. At the time, it mainly praised simple, massive wooden furniture elements of a traditional typology and combined into traditional furniture suites. However, as the years passed, the Union's definition of rural furniture evolved and became more flexible. For example, from the early 50s on, the Union of Farmers' Wives advised its members only to buy the furniture elements it needed, instead of whole suites of furniture, and it accepted the use of new and cheaper materials, such as plywood or eternit. And this is an example of the simple models that they appreciated. The then main characteristics of good rural furniture were related to its practical use, its solid construction, and to the simplicity of its forms. However, these were also the characteristics of the furniture recommended by the Catholic workers' women. Another element the Union of Farmers' Wives paid broad attention to was the design of the mantelpiece. In the early post-war years, the Union especially praised the model of the Flemish mantelpiece. With a tubular stove and a traditional decoration consisting of a rug, a crucifix, candles, tin dish dishes, etc. For those who did not have a Flemish mantelpiece and were unable to build one, the Union of Farmers' Wives provided several detailed designs of good mantelpieces with more modest proportions. However, in the first half of the 50s also, this specific aspect of the rural interior underwent a significant evolution. First of all, the use of the typical Flemish mantelpiece was questioned, as it was originally meant for an open fire, and only few modern stove types aesthetically fitted in. Moreover, if the functional organization of the house required so, the union suggested that it was possible to situate the mantelpiece in the corner of the room instead of in the middle of the wall. Furthermore, the house, in the House of Our Dreams, several modern designs were on show, which in their simplicity even further distanced themselves from the traditional prototypes. And you see one of those examples here on, on, the, on the left on the slide. But again, we may wonder how different the resulting modern rural mantelpieces were from those promoted from the Catholic workers' women, as the same mantelpiece also appears in an exhibition that was organized by the Catholic workers' women. You see two pictures here again that can be compared. We may conclude that the Belgian Union of Farmers' Wives fought for a lost cause. The tradition the traditional rural environment vanished in the course of the 50s and the union was not able to prevent it. However, thanks to its increasing professionalism and the continuous updates of its detailed home advice, for a long time the union was able to continue its advice programs on rural living, even though the concept of rural living received totally different meanings and the idea of the education and the idea of education partly lost its ethical dimension as it had to find its way in a booming world of consumer and lifestyle messages. Thank you, this was my final slide.
I'll unshare my screen now. Thank you very much, Freddie. That was great. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm sure people have many questions and they can start to formulate those, but we're going to save those until after our second paper. So um, I'm going to uh, move now to Maria for a moment to um, uh, get her screen ready. So um, uh, Maria uh, Gorenstotter uh, works as a lecturer in design history and theory at Umeå Institute of Design in Sweden. Her research and teaching focus is on uh, core cool concepts, methods and ideas in design and critically engages with the histori historicity of design in current and collaborative design practices. Um, uh, her, uh, her dissertation in industrial design, transitional design histories, is about to be examined. That puts you on the spot. And, and we're also very, very grateful uh, for Maria to um, spare the time to join us at this conference at this kind of critical moment. I gather it's within days, is that right? Yes, okay. So we, we wish you all the very best with that. But first of all, we're gonna get the opportunity to hear your paper which is titled Design Methods in the Kitchen on the Feminist Origins of Scandinavian User-Centered Design. And I'll turn my camera off and hand over to you now, Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, and yes, this, uh, this presentation is actually uh, based on a study in my dissertation. So the, it takes sort of a, 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 a little different uh, perspective, uh, which is what my dissertation is about. I suggest that uh, design history needs to matter more to contemporary designing. Uh, and I also suggest that for that uh, sort of shift to happen, we would need to try to make design histories that are closer to where design practice stands today. So sort of shifting uh, our focus in the history of design from um, maybe a, a product or design outcome focus to move closer to uh, a perspective of methods in contemporary designing. So uh, my idea here, my suggestion is that if we, uh, if we try to make design histories from a perspective of methods um, and of sort of opening up the concepts and practices and questioning where they come from, what kinds of histories uh, sort of carry over into today's practices, we might find ways to open up for doing design differently. So this presentation is part of, you could say, my experimentation with trying to figure out what happens if we take this kind of methods perspective to making design histories. Uh, and this example then is about um, an organization or an institute uh, in Sweden that uh, was called the Hemmens Forskningsinstitut, the Home Research Institute. Uh, that was founded in 1944. Uh, and uh, I've, I've tried to um, sort of reapproach this institute from the perspective of user-centered design methods. So looking at their publications, which are on the top right side of this slide, and, and lots of archival materials uh, from a perspective of the kind of industrial design uh, that usually is labeled user-centered design. And this, this is quite a strong you say, design approach in Scandinavia, in the Nordic countries, but also in very many other design practices. Uh, and basically, in, uh, if we do a really short just uh, sketch of what user-centered des design uh, is about, it is about designing together with people and designing for people. So bringing a use and user perspective to design. And uh, this approach is very highly focused on developing methods for designing together with people. And in... Um, you'd say in, in the few and very um, scattered design histories that there are of this approach in Scandinavian design, uh, the, the, 
sort of current uh, explanation or story of origin of these methods is that they um, were formed in the 1970s and 1980s in contexts of, I would say, uh, designers trying to bring in new ways of designing together with people for people who hadn't been considered actively in designing uh, earlier. So a lot of the inclusive design um, approaches in designing for the disabled or also when new technologies came in uh, in the Nordic countries, there is a very strong, I would say, uh, tradition of pointing to uh, labor union initiatives in influencing workplace um, workplace matters through design when computers were introduced in in workplaces in the 1970s and 80s. So this is sort of the general story of where Scandinavian user center design comes from. Uh, and some of the methods that are then uh, considered core in this this field or these fields uh, have to do with finding finding methods for understanding use and users so typically one points to uh, bringing in ergonomics or uh, ethnography different kinds of observation techniques for understanding use but also bringing users uh, and non-designers into the design process through different methods that have to do with um, taking design decisions together with the testing out different concepts together with people who are skilled users and, and co-creating things that way. Often in these kinds of uh, very brief histories of user-centered design, uh, these methods, some of them at least ergonomics, anthropometrics and so on, uh, are uh, traced back to the 1940s and 50s and uh, people such as Henry Dreyfus or to, to the military industry in, in developing and designing cockpits, for example, for fighter pilots and so on. So, so a very strong emphasis on that. But what I argue is that at least in Sweden and in um, the Nordic countries, we can find uh, an alternative history to where these kinds of user-centered methods come from. And through that history also maybe question what is it that these methods carry with them? How can we approach design uh, in current practice and in emergent practices? And I argue then that the Home Research Institute uh, actually, you could say, developed many of the, the core methods and the foundations for what later became known as user-centered design. But this institute hasn't been acknowledged as one where designing has taken place. It has been acknowledged in the history of technology or the history of um, uh, feminism or gender issues um, as a place where, where you could say consumer interests have been uh, promoted uh, by the Institute or where technology has been assessed and evaluated and domestic appliances and, and uh, so on have been tried and tested. Uh, it's also been pointed to as a place where, of course, rationalization of housework and domestic work took place. Uh, and all of these stories are true about the Institute, but I would like to highlight then uh, how this focus on domestic work and uh, you could say the, the kitchen as a place in the home for this Home Research Institute both became a way of developing a user-centered design methodology and influencing a larger socio-political discussion and change in Sweden at the time. Um, and this, um, say the, the, to give just a very, very brief background, uh, this Home Research Institute spoke quite a lot to um, a, a, a figure or a trope that had become very dominant in Sweden uh, from the 1920s and 30s onwards, where the home, both in a very material and a very sort of ideological meaning, was central to uh, bringing about change in society. So in the 1930s, uh, and still in the 1940s, Sweden was one of the countries in Europe that uh, had the lowest standard of living. living. There was a, a huge housing crisis. 
Uh, and one, uh, one of the, I'd say, strong initiatives to change this came with the election of a social democratic government in the early 1930s that actually brought in modernist, uh, say, a, a modernist uh, ethics and aesthetics and uh, approach to the building of housing uh, and brought that into state and government policy in order to solve the housing question in Sweden. And this was part of a larger ideological project that also had very um, strong metaphors uh, in terms of the home, because this whole say, socio-political project that the social democratic government initiated uh, was formulated as building the people's home where everyone would have equal opportunities, where the standards of living and the access to education and to to work and so on would be more egalitarian than before. So this idea of the home as a very central place for bringing about social political change was already quite established through say this, this effort and the centrality of the housing question. So when we are in the 1940s, Sweden is in the middle of a huge transition. Again, as we've heard in, in previous uh, presentations also, the, the transition from a rural to a more urban uh, way of life that also had to do with handling issues of, of modernity. Uh, and in this process of forming Sweden into a people's home or a, or a welfare state, the, the centrality of the material of the house, of the home, of, of furniture uh, in order to bring about change uh, was similar to, to that in many other countries. Uh, what we saw in the 1940s connected to this political project was that uh, government initiated uh, state committees were given tasks to uh, provide research foundations for actually say, finding other and better and more um, efficient ways to build housing, to uh, um, conduct building research, engineering research, and so on. And several women's organizations had also then pushed very hard for establishing a research institute that would be focused on the domestic sphere, uh, on um, different kinds of, of issues having to do with domestic work and, and house work. Uh, that was wasn't uh, instated by the government. So instead, a range of women's organizations took that matter into their own hands, uh, managed to secure funding from, from different sources, and founded the Home Research Institute, Hemans Forskningsinstitut, in 1944, uh, with the outspoken ambition to study housework as a whole, as they said in their um, statutes. And what they meant with as a whole was to study housework in the context of economic, social, and technical development. Uh, and that was the main purpose. Then they also had uh, ambitions to provide guidelines for rationalization of housework. Uh, and their last, uh, and perhaps the, the ambition that I connect most to that here is was to investigate consumption goods and give judgments on their composition in order to guide producers, vendors, and buyers, and to give producers ideas for improvements. Now, what I say is that this ambition uh, to, to give ideas for improvements, uh, that the initiatives at the HFI went way beyond that uh, because they actually started designing things themselves as well. Uh, in, uh, in histories of the Home Research Institute, one thing, one very tangible outcome uh, that the, the Institute led, led to, the work at the Institute led to uh, national standards for kitchen, fitted kitchens uh, in different ways already in 1950. So that, I'd say, the, the norms and standards for building kitchens was something that the HFI directly contributed to. But what they also very strongly contributed to was uh, an attempt to shift, I'd say, how women's efforts in society were valued uh, and the kind of influence that women could have through conducting research in areas where women were 
uh, considered to be and then even um, say on a research base established as experts in their field. So the Home Research Institute from 1944, it was initiated by women. Uh, it was all run by women, women who were architects, nutritional scientists, um, and experts in different fields conducting studies uh, of different types of housework that say, were, were common to um, most, most or all Swedish home at the time. Uh, so, in previous histories, in history of technology, for example, there has been a quite strong focus on the work at the HFI that had to do with rationalizing housework. Uh, but it's quite interesting to uh, l take a deeper look at the kinds of methods and approaches um, conducted at the HFI because the outspoken ambition at the Institute was to avoid exact definitions of both what kinds of research should be uh, carried out, what could be considered housework, and what should be, um, what, what kind of rationalization or changes should be brought about. So there was a very, very open research question that had to do with systematically building as much knowledge as possible in as many areas as possible in order to find solutions or propositions to handling domestic issues in very radically different ways than before. So at the HFI, um, what the, the different, um, we say the initial areas of, of housework that one began to investigate were uh, very basic ones. So dishwashing was the first study uh, conducted. A second one was done on baking and a third one on cleaning floors and this all started in 1944. Uh, and these studies were done in laboratory environments set up at the Home Research Institute, thoroughly documented uh, down to the you know, chemical composition of different detergents and in combination with different, uh, different uh, water temperatures the atmospheric pressure in, in the room when the test dishwashing took place and so on. And then of course, trying uh, and testing all uh, material utensils and fittings available on the market. So testing in practice in the laboratory, all kinds of sinks that were available in Sweden at this time, all kinds of dish brushes, all kinds of dish stands and so on. So this was done and, and measured uh, very accurately. Then uh, there were also observation studies made in people's homes. So visiting women in their home environment, uh, studying again, very meticulously and documenting how actually the practice of dishwashing happened in, uh, in older apartments, such as on this picture or in newer apartments built in accordance with modernist principles and the very, say, modern Frankfurt kitchen inspired, um, very rational kitchens. And these studies showed that uh, both old and new apartments, old and new kitchens uh, offered challenges uh, when put to use. Uh, the bench, the work height could be too low as in the previous image or the kitchen such as in this modern kitchen wasn't at all designed from a perspective of use. So here the, the woman doing the dishes has to place the dirty dishes on the stove uh, and she has to place the dish stand on a chair next to the sink because it doesn't fit. So doing these kinds of very basic studies led to uh, the development of different methods for trying to figure out and assess and map what is it that we do when we do housework? How, how do we use the utensils and what could be done differently? Uh, so measuring, uh, as in these diagrams, the, the motions, um, the frequency of motions, the movements in the kitchen or the energy consumption, for example, measured in the Douglas sack for calorimetry that uh, measures the, the carbon monoxide in the air when doing dishes, all gave very hard statistics for uh, a basis of, of thinking differently around how 
things are put to use and how things could be done differently. So both the material things and things as practices. Uh, then establishing women as experts uh, also meant that not only the laboratory hired staff at the HFI were considered experts, but women working in kitchens all around Sweden were engaged in giving feedback and, um, uh, and testing different things. So through different housewives organizations, the HFI Institute sent out um, for example, in, in the dishwashing study, dish brushes and dish stands to uh, housewives all over Sweden who would test these utensils for a couple of months, fill in forms with feedback and send that into the research institute to give feedback on what, how this worked and what could be improved. So we have here one of the central let's say, th things uh, or methods also in user-centered design, actually trying things out together with actual users. Uh, and this, uh, let's say the, the, this whole practice of um, um, trying to find the methods for rethinking housework from a design perspective was something that brought together women from very many different, you could say, directions uh, of, of feminist conviction. Uh, one of the main feminist theorists in Sweden at that time, Elin Wagner, uh, said in a public speech that this kind of work was really important because it might seem insignificant, but one can be begin with rejecting a dish brush and end with liberating oneself from a whole form of civilization. So this was a a markedly feminist uh, stance than in how women would be able to influence uh, the social political uh, events in Sweden as well than as influencing how design is done. And if we look then at user-centered design and some of the components uh, that have to do with methodology and design, we can see that the HFI, for example, uh, in their testing things in use, bring in ergonomics very strongly. And uh, there were very few studies at that time. There were a few German studies on hand ergonomics, but studying ergonomic of grips had to be developed methodologically at the HFI. Uh, so doing these kinds of user tests from an ergonomic perspective also led to the development of another kind of methodology very central to uh, user-centered design, which is iterative prototyping. So out based on used testing and evaluating and uh, the trying out different concepts together with users. And here on this picture, then we see uh, one of the, the prototyping um, em employees at the HFI who is making different concept handles for uh, kitchen knives out of plastic clay, uh, testing that in an iterative process together with 24 women uh, brought in as, as users of different levels of expertise that then eventually then in collaboration with uh, um, a, a knife producing company led to a whole brand of new kinds of knives with an ergonomic, uh, say, an ergonomic design to them. So this uh, this kind of focus on user-centered design methods when approaching a historical material such as the Home Home Research Institute, I mean, can actually shed new light on where design methods are understood to come from. So uh, what I'm showing now is the. ISO standard for human-centered design, it was called user-centered design before, uh, which states several different uh, criteria that have to be met in, in order to be user-centered. And if we look at those and compare them to what was being done at the Home Research Institute in the 1940s, uh, these match quite well. So uh, with that, I just want to show a, a very brief uh, film from 1944 uh, that promoted the work done at the Home Research Institute, where we see the amount of, uh, of things tried and tested and the methods developed. Uh, right now, this is a method for uh, testing the durability of different kinds of porcelain uh, that later became 
set as a standard in the 1950s, uh, a VDN standard stating uh, durability of porcelain uh, in different degrees. Uh, there are also uh, other uh, images where we can see that much, much of the uh, kinds of methods used for studying domestic work were brought in, for example, from uh, scientific management, the same kind as you would see in industry with uh, measuring, um, having time measurements and with documenting grips, documenting motions and finding different ways of, of rationalizing. So you'd have the time study clerk hired uh, to do those exact measurements in order to give a very, um, say, st statistically uh, precise um, foundation for thinking differently about not only how to research and investigate housework, but how that would fit into a larger context of rethinking uh, what society could be and how these kinds of initiatives could play into designing things differently. And with that, I would like to end my presentation and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. That was fantastic. And the film at the end um, was, was wonderful. I'm sure we wish we could see more. Um, okay, well, thank you to both our speakers, to Freddie and, and Maria, who, uh, Freddie's just rejoined us. I think you can see uh, all three of us now, and we're going to move to questions. So I think Sorsha is going to open the, um, the Q&A, uh, which I'll be able to see in a minute. If you'll just um, let me pause for now while I uh, while I find it, and once I have that, I'll um, I'll share the questions with with uh, you and with the audience so we know who's put them and um, and what they are. I'm afraid I'm having a trouble to see the questions at the moment. There should be a Q and A um, icon. I know. Explain. I'm sorry. Do you I'm want me to read? So. Will I read the first one out? Would you mind, Sorsha, because it's not opening for me at the moment. I am. Um, it's from, and I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce this, Figan Isek. He says, thank you for your presentations. He's, Freddie, Freddie said, modern, comfortable and Christian home. So they want to know, are there any aspects and or norms coming from being a Christian woman specifically? Okay. Um, well, thank you for that question. Um, well, the, the whole um, home advice uh, program of the, um, of the union of uh, farmers' wives is, is kind of encapsulated or embedded in the, the ideology of, of Christianity. So, um, um, and related to the advice on the home, the, the, the basic um, idea is that the nuclear, nuclear family is the is the, the solid foundation of uh, post-war society, uh, as it actually was also before the war, but it, they really go back to that idea as being really fundamental to rebuilding the world after the war. And uh, the booklets that, that the, the Union of Farmers Wives published on the house and on the model house and the house of our dreams are very explicit in what the role of the, the housewife is, namely, um, she's, she's the key person who has to, you know, make the house into a happy home to support the husband in, in his work. Um, and um, you see, yeah, so the, the, the approach of these, at least in the 1950s, um, of this organization is very, is very, has a very paternalistic uh, overtone and is very clear in in the advice to women. So they, they have to make sure that the house is a Christian house, that it's safe for the children, that it's a good house for the husband. And she is basically responsible for making it a loving, a loving environment. Um, so I hope that kind of answers the question. Uh, th thank you, Freddie. That's great. I am going to have to continue to ask Sorsha to do the questions. I'm very sorry, my uh, question panel uh, on my screen isn't opening. So, Sorsha, could you, could you go to the next one? 
and that's what we've got all we've got for it at the moment so if anybody else in the audience wants to ask a question you can put it into the q a box I think the, maria also just put a did, did you did you want to come back maria as well oh, I, I wanted to ask freddie a question but i think we can do that later <laughs> so so why, don't, no, why, don't, why don't you lead on it, the next question and, and go ahead You want to go ahead? Yeah, um, I, because I, I wanted to ask you, Freddie, in, in that material, I mean, with, with the woman being the center of the home and responsible for all that, were there any sort of discussions around the role of, of the husband needing to change or any, you know? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that the material that I worked on was not as progressive as yours, <laughs> because, I, because I was really, yeah, fascinated by the, the, the you know, the, the idea of women as experts. They were considered experts in the context of the Union of Farmers Wives, but it was quite, in the 1950s, it was still very, quite a quite con conservative approach. So the, I think in the booklet, um, they do refer to the husband, but it's clear that the woman is, you know, she has to be the leading, has to take the lead in, the, in organizing the house. But if she kindly asks, she could ask the husband to support uh, her in building the home, you know, in smaller tasks. It's, it's really explained like this. So it's, it's not at all progressive in the 1950s. I mean, in this context, um, later on that changes um, more in the 1960s. Um, but in the 1950s, we are still, and Belgium is still a very, um, yeah, so that you still have the, a very organized, you know, ideologically organized society, the Catholics, the socialists, and it's, a, yeah, it's still quite a conservative uh, approach to, to home building. Mm. Well, I wonder if I will come in with a, uh, uh, with a question from Maria, actually, which um, is, is on this question of ex female expertise. Mm -hmm. And um, I wondered if you could maybe tell us something about what happens to that idea of female expertise as the scientific design methods kind of movement takes hold because in the UK from the 60s that's a very male dominated type of kind of corner of design design practice um, mm. does that does the is, is there a continuation of expertise from the from the home institute or or do they kind of get lost do they do they move across or do they kind of get lost is that acknowledged i, I would my my brief answer would be to say that i think this needs more investigation than i've done so far because uh i uh, what i see is that in at that time in the 40s and 50s what the uh, home research institute were doing their practices were considered in some sense to be design uh, back then so when when the concept of industrial design is introduced in sweden in 1943 in a, a, a special article series uh, the the expert housewife is uh, is introduced as an expert also on industrial design from the domestic perspective and m very many of the images that are used to depict uh, what industrial design is show designs made at the home research institute so in the 1940s and in the 1950s this was considered design but it hasn't been considered design in the histories we tell about where scandinavian industry center design comes from so yeah and I, think, I see the questions. Should I? There's, yeah, there's I'm actually, really sorry about this. There, there, <laughs> there's actually six questions here. Yeah, so we have so. Do you want to go ahead, Sorsha? Yeah, the first one is from Barbara Penner, and it's asking Maria. She says, "I also believe that home engineers pioneered user-centered design methods in America too. How do you account for the fact that this alternative genealogy has been so overlooked?" And I think that that connects to the to what we just talked about. And and I, I would uh, actually propose that why it has been overlooked is is because of the uh, the gap in outlook between uh, current, you could say, contemporary designing and the kinds of design histories that we uh, tend to make. So we haven't we haven't really made design histories from a perspective of where does designing as practiced today come from? We've done histories of some, some kinds of designing, 
but not not maybe this kind. And I think that that is also why these alternative histories about where our methods come from have uh, haven't been visible. Thank you. And there's also a question for you from Figen as well, which says that um, Swedish people are taller than average in the world. And so what do you think is the reason behind the lower counters in the kitchens back then being one of the aspects researched? Mm. I I wouldn't uh, I I wouldn't be able to say why they were lower before, but I mean I I do know that this whole research initiative and and the establishment of standards actually then has I mean with this whole systematic measuring of things that there was they made so many studies at the HFI about you know what is normal height and how what kind of height uh, is. Uh, is appropriate for women now and if we take um, you know a perspective towards the future but then again it was all about women doing the dishes and working at the counters very rarely did we see that men were invited to participate in these studies and and were thought of as as active in the kitchen well, thank you and there's a question for both of you from Clara Mahoney who asks if you could both tell us more about how or if your fascinating case study organizations engage with problematic as well as ideal homes or users. You want to start, Freddie? Um, yes, I am giving it some thought, but um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to understand pro problematic. Uh, uh, um, People who didn't meet the ideals, I guess. Yes, so I, I, I can give- Or maybe didn't want to. Yes, so um, I can give a double answer, I think, to that, or there's two things to say. Um, in the 1950s, at least in, in Belgium, there's still a lot of kind of black and white uh, discourse on that. So you have the, you have the bad, um, you know, the, the badly organized houses or the, the poor, the poorly organized houses, which are being confronted in discourse with the ideal. So this black and white strategy of, of making a point through opposing um, two examples is still very much in use and the discourses of also of the um, Union of Belgian, um, of Belgian farmers' wives. Um, and uh, another thing is that what their strategy also was to make houses better or houses that were problematic better so on the one hand, they would publish, they would talk, they would um, organize lectures on the ideal, on the ideal that they propose, but they would also um, be open to discuss uh, houses that would try to become more ideal in the sense that they would organize uh, questionnaires for their members um, and some members would be asked um, to explain to what extent they were able to apply the ideal to their own home. And some of the examples were also visited by the organization and some of the, the, the examples that were not ideal yet, but were uh, getting better thanks to their uh, great advice, were being published also in the, in the periodicals of the organization. So it was really a kind of, the idea was to emancipate uh, home culture and to emancipate it in a Christian way. Um, so they, they, they worked with people that did not uh, have the ideal yet, but the idea was then to, to push them or to stimulate them to come closer to the ideal that they are promoting. Hope that's more or less an answer. And I can, I can build on that also because uh, on the emancipatory perspective side of things, uh, what what I see in the material now, that when taking this sort of practice uh, practice based perspective on on histories of user centered design, um, I mean that is that is still an issue in uh, in our design endeavors today. I mean, how do we balance emancipatory ideals with actual prescriptive, um, you know, modes of use, uh, if we talk about everything from sustainability, I mean, do, can we prescribe certain 
actions through design to take us towards a more sustainable uh, future. Uh, so, and I think that when looking at uh, material from from the 20th century, uh, what I see, at least in in the organizations that I study, um, is that that awareness of of the difficulties in balancing roles and responsibilities between designers and users is there already when when user centered design starts to approach so in in my material i can see uh, discussions around okay so what is actually a problem here what what does if people don't behave as we design the houses or the the objects to promote them to behave is the problem with how it's being used or our basis for designing do the designers need to go back and re rethink and and understand use in a different way from the perspective of what people actually want to be able to do or does the designer then take a stance and say okay so we see you using a thing or an environment or a home this way that is wrong you need to do it this way and that sort of um, the, the conflict between making something possible and pre prescribing something is there already in the 1940s, at least in the Swedish material. Okay, okay. thank you. Because and there's two more questions from Maria that I, I might take together because they're they're related to each other. One is from Alice Naylor, and she's asking about whether the establishment of the HFI led to for more acceptance of female designers from the 50s onwards. And Pauline Garvey is asking how contemporary designers respond to this argument that it's a forerunner of user-centered design. Do they see the, those links themselves? I I think I'm, I can, uh, I'll be defending my thesis on Friday, so I'll get to know more than <laughs> <laughs> sort of sending it out in the world but I can I can say from from my teaching at least with design students because I mean I've been I've been promoting this perspective and, and making this argument with them and I think that um, I mean people it, it's difficult to unsee the the kind of connections and the kind of methodologies that are there but then I think that what what I would like us to have the discussion about is not only sort of the, the genealogy of where methods come from, but what it means to apply a certain design methodology today that was actually uh, constructed in the 1940s in a certain type of environment in a certain kind of socio-political context with a very feminist ambition. Uh, because I think that that opens up for seeing some of these methods, both as uh, you know opening up possibilities, but also as carrying some some values or some kind of ideas uh, with them that we might not want to reenact today. So I think that uh, since that is that is what I hope for these kinds of histories to be able to do to to sort of open up our thinking in design about the concepts we use, the methods we apply from, uh, from the perspective of, of rethinking what might we need to do differently, then yes, I think that that, um, that aspect is there. Uh, so the design, many designers see that. Uh, and I don't think that the establishment of the HFI led to more acceptance for female designers because then we wouldn't have the kind of inequalities that we have in industrial design and many other design fields today. So, and I think, again, thinking of the histories we tell, the possibilities we show, the trajectories we make um, through understanding our present in terms of the stories we tell about where we come from can give different openings for where we head in the future. So I do hope that making different histories uh, will make a difference in, in that field as well. Yeah. And that, uh, that leads into Isolto Cleary's question, which was what, whether the scientific ex experiments trying to establish a more streamlined approach to housework or sorry, were they the scientific experiments trying to establish a more streamlined approach to housework with a view to women entering the workplace and spending less time at home? I would say that for, for some of those engaged in the HFI, yes. For others, no. Uh, so, and this is where sort of conflicting, um, uh, you say conflicting agendas still came together in the HFI. So you, you would have the, I think, um, 
what, was it you, Freddie, who talked about m maternal feminists, or was that someone? That was, that was, that was me. you, Sasha. Yeah. So you you would have both those who who um, argued that this kind of uh, th this kind of uh, rationalization and and professionalization of housework uh, would enable women to uh, you know not not be the main uh, the, not not have their main sphere in the domestic sphere but you could actually rationalize and then go out and work uh, with, with salaried uh, a salaried work outside the home and be equal to to men but there were also others who who actually very heavily promoted that being a housewife was a profession in itself so you should actually have a salary in order to do that, you should have paid vacation and you should have a good work environment with good utensils. So these very different sort of aims came together there as well. I just wondered if, uh, uh, Freddie, you made the point in your paper about, about the focus coming in on the, the kind of the home within the plan rather than the farm as a, as a whole. And I, mm -hmm. and I wondered if there was something to say there about the farmer's wife's role as partner in business or what you know what 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 the expectations of her role outside of the confines of the home would have been and how that might be changing um well uh, um the the focus of the the discourse itself is mainly on um is mainly on organ how she organizes the ho uh, the house and um um, my impression is that in the beginning, it's it's still clear that she is um, co she is a co worker in the in the farm eh? she, because in the earlier years, uh, especially in the nineteen forty five booklet, it's still the house is still conceived as part of a farm, and we are still talking about really about peasants, I think you can say, or people working on on the land, um, but. As in the course of the 50s, the, the population that the organization is addressing is becoming much more diverse. Um, um, the discussion on what the role of the, the, the woman, of the, the, the housewife is also in the farm gets to the backgrounds and, and the focus is really, the, the whole discourse is about the house. I haven't found much discourse on what she would be doing outside of the house. So the, the, it's a really a quite, yeah, it's quite, uh, quite enclosed uh, discourse, very much on what her role as woman is in, in organizing and, and making it a good Christian home. Mm. Okay, thank you. So, did we have more questions on the yeah. list? I think there is Yeah, two. there's two I more. Can't... Well, one is Alice Nader saying thank you for answering the question. <laughs> um, and then we have Ezra Nazir who says thank you for the presentations and then has a question for each of you. So, so Freddie, she asks, religion seems co consolidating the tenets of modernization. It was interesting to get informed about this as religion is mostly considered as a more conservative realm. But through further steps, did you note any conflicts between religion and concepts of modernity and feminism? Mm. Or were they working? I think I would, I think I would answer that. Um, so you could say on the one hand that the, the, the efforts of the, the union of farmer's wife was, you know, recuperating ideas, modernist ideas, and was, in, you know, using them, integrating them in their uh, ideal vision of the house. But at the same time, it was a constant, uh, it was a constant conflict or a constant negotiation between religion and directly linked to religion the the ideal of the of the rural house because that was you know that's where that represents morality for the for uh, and ethical values um so there was there was this constant negotiation but you see um that through time more and more elements of a mod what you could call a modernist view on the house uh were accepted but but it's really a negotiation. Every element or every step taken is discussed, and they they do discuss a lot. Um, I mean, I mentioned the questionnaires, but they they are very much in touch with their their members. So that's a very big difference with the more modernist organization or the the designer organizations of that time, who also organized uh, exhibitions on the modern home, but were actually 
much less in touch with the, the public that they wanted to, um, you know, convince of, of a modern house. So on the one hand, you could say modernism is introduced much slower and much, you know, is really negotiated through these women organizations from a Christian background, but uh, they, they really negotiate and they, they go back and forth uh, asking, you know, what did you like? What, what were you able to apply from our advice? What could we do better to convince you of the fact that this is the ideal um, to work to? So it's a, it's a constant but evolving conflict, I would say. Okay, thank you. And for Maria, um, she's saying it was very interesting to follow the histories of design methodologies in the context of user research. What can we say is specific in a Northern context? Ooh, that's a big one. <laughs> uh, I would say, to, to keep it a bit short, is that um, in, in the Nordic context, the use, kind of user-centered design that I just briefly sketched here uh, has carried very strong political elements already from uh, what we could say are the origins, if we trace them to the 1940s or even further back to, to the turn of the century, 1900, and link this to ideas of democratic parliamentary participation, for example. So, uh, and I think that that very strong political element in thinking around use uh, is something that is quite specific to the Scandinavian context. If, if we were to trace ideas about use uh, towards the US, for example, then, then there is a much stronger usability focus. So, uh, looking more instrumentally at how to how, how to um, perform design so that requirements of usability are met and then at some point we see these merging and then that there's a whole whole other discourse but but the the very problematic concept of use and users has been uh, tricky in, in Scandinavian design and, and in the Nordic countries in methods development, at least from 30s and 40s. And I think that is something quite interesting to, to think about when we are also talking about developing different kinds of design methods that go beyond user-centered or human-centered design when we're talking about more than human design, for example. What happens, what is use in, in a context of uh, social media and and the kind of big data generating societies that that we are all a part of what 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 is use what is a user can we even talk about users in design anymore or do we need to talk in a different way to open up for thinking differently for the future thank you i can see i think we've come to the end of the questions um, from the audience, it, uh, I can just see the number count and it's gone down. So, um, uh, and we are approaching uh, the end of the afternoon. I think people will be uh, uh, having to start to leave, but I wonder whether I might wrap up with one more question. Given the theme of national parallels, maybe both of you could um, just say something about what, what, what if any international comparisons may have been being drawn or international networks exploited or where, where, what directions they might have been looking in outside of the um, national context uh, or if you think it was it was very much around the specificity of, of that kind of um, that, that, that national context. So I don't know who, Freddie do you want to go first? Or? Yes um, I can. Um, so I, so on the one hand I would say the the histories that we that we've brought in this session are, are very colored by by the national context um i i in, in belgium for example the kind of scientific uh, um, research that was done in the institute that maria is talking about no way that that kind of research would have been done <laughs> in belgium i i well at least i don't know anything about that and um, but I don't think uh, it was, it had been done. Um, it has been done, but um, um, if I do um, think, if I would have to make some um, suggestions of an international perspective that, that is relevant, uh, is I think, uh, um, so the, in case of the, the women organizations, the, the Christian women organizations, they were 
quite well aware of what was happening internationally. So there were some connections, not very strong ones, but with, for example, what was going on in the SIAM. Um, mm. um, so they were aware of these discussions on, you know, the, the, um, um, the, the kitchen as a laboratory. They even use the term, um, but then nuance it again, because of course, in a, in a rural house, you don't want a laboratory, you need something else. Um, that's one thing. And also the, the debate as it was developed in France was, was uh, known also, especially on the, on the kitchen and on the house. I think it's Paulette Bernage who also published articles that were being republished in Belgian architectural magazines. And uh, these, I mean, the, the leading figures of the Christian workers' women, for example, knew of these articles. Um, but again, interpret, they, they incorporate some of the modernist ideas uh, and, or those aspects that they, they thought were fit for their, for their audience and for their community. Okay, thank you. Maria? For the Home Research Institute, I would say that they, <laughs> they worked with what we today call outreach in a very systematic way, both in sort of sharing what they were doing. So in, in all of their publications, they, 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 I showed initially the, the HFI publications on a slide. They always had summaries in English of every, uh, every article specifically regarding the methods development. So they, it's quite clear that they, they aim to contribute to an international Sort of conversation on on design methods and on uh, home research. Uh, they also traveled extensively to to do study visits and had had quite a lot of contacts both with the U.S., the U.K., with Germany specifically, and hosted uh, study visits of their own because their the people came from engineering, architecture, other women's organizations, uh, design organizations. Uh, so massive amounts of study visits to the Home Research Institute. You can see lists of people. They had so many that they had to hire someone uh, to do, you know, the, the kinds of presentations that the director wouldn't be doing. So just, you know, when, when just an ordinary someone comes and wants to see, we need to have someone to, to do that kind of guided tour. So they, they, they did work very internationally. Okay, thank you both. Um, well, perhaps uh, uh, if following from, that's a good point to conclude, but also to um, indicate we might pick up these conversations tomorrow in the remaining two sessions for the, um, for the conference. So can I say thank you to both our speakers, to Fred and Maria for fantastic papers, really well aligned and, and for, to the audience um, um, for, your, uh, for your great questions and to Sorsha for handling those when I couldn't see them. Um, uh, so Sorsha, there are two more sessions tomorrow. People, you reminded yeah. me that people are still able to sign up to those um, up until kind of the moment the session starts really, you can. Yeah, uh, um, there's two sessions. The one in the morning is about science and modernity in West Germany and the United States. So that's uh, Barbara Kenner from Bartlett School of Architecture talking about the Cornell Kitchen. And then Sophie Gerber from the Technische Museum in Vienna talking about the modern kitchen in West Germany. That's on at 11 a.m. And then at 3 p.m. is Women in Education in Canada and in Spain, which is Ru Professor Ruth Sandwell from the University of Toronto is talking about re-educating women for this new energy regime in um, Canada. And uh, Ana Maria Fernandez Garcia talking about the Spanish kitchen and how it's evolved in rural and urban contexts. And I just wanted to also add as well that we've put up this morning the, an online component to the Kitchen Power exhibition. So if you're interested in looking at delving a little bit more in the Irish context, if you go to the museum.ie website, it should be set up as the exit page for everybody when you leave the seminar that it's got more detail and more detailed pages uh, with material from the exhibition and photographs of some of the objects and things like that. So there's more detail that people can look at there as well. So, Thank you, Joshua, because in, in the original plan, we would now be retiring to see the exhibition and probably have a glass of wine. So maybe yeah. if everybody could just go and pour themselves a drink, sit down and visit the website. 
<laughs> we'll be as close as we can get to it. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you all tomorrow, hopefully. Yeah. And uh, thanks for a wonderful session. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.